I'm sure people say they have had their heart broken. My heart was never broken until I lost Dennis. Feels like it happened yesterday. There's not one day that I don't think about my brother, like wondering, you know, what he would have been doing right now. I looked up to him, I respected him, like, just like a father. If I get bad grades, my mom wouldn't, she's like, I'm showing Uncle Dennis. That was the hardest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, losing him. A struggle over an officer's weapon, a deadly shooting, and a Lynn, Massachusetts neighborhood in shock. Witnesses say it all started with a shouting match in the King's Lynn apartment complex just after 11 a.m. Thursday morning. Dennis Reynoso, a 29-year-old father and military veteran, was shot and killed by police in his fiance's home in Lynn on September 5th, 2013. A woman called 911, saying Reynoso was screaming and walking around outside the apartment complex without a shirt on. Police were called. Reynoso was fatally wounded within minutes of the officers entering his apartment. It's one of many recent police shootings in Massachusetts that have involved an apparent case of mental illness. Whoever it was, he, he was seeing demons. Not only did the district attorney find the shootings to be justified, he said the officers acted in self-defense. I thought I was, was going to die um, when he put that gun to my head. Months later, then-Governor Deval Patrick presented the officers with an award for bravery. But Reynoso's family maintains that justice wasn't served, that he shouldn't have been killed, and that the officers responsible shouldn't have been honored. They should be removed from the force. I see one unarmed man in his home with his five-year-old son. I see three armed officers entering his home, whether he's in the right state of mind or not. The cops were not called to that apartment. I tried to see perspective, but honestly, at the end of the day, it was just such a minor incident, noise complaint, disturbed the peace call. They protested after Reynoso's death, and activists didn't forget about the case. During demonstrations in the summer of 2020, in the wake of George Floyd's death, crowds chanted Reynoso's name. What do we want? Justice! 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 Reopen the case! Reopen the case! It just seemed like another one of those mental health calls that went wrong where they sent the police and, you know, it never went to trial. There was no indictment. Now we'll take you inside the investigation. You'll hear from the police officers hours after the shooting, watch original crime scene footage, and meet witnesses and EMTs who responded on scene. And along with the family, we asked experts, was justice done in this case? And what can we learn from it? It's a terrible tragedy, and it's a tragedy that is happening more and more often as we deal with issues on the street with people dealing with mental illness. This is the case of Dennis Reynoso. I met Dennis at Roll World, which is a roller skating palace on Route 1. Um, probably when we were in like sixth or seventh grade. We would just like roller skate, hold hands, things like that. He was very quiet. He was like a shy boy. My mom always told me like he calmed me down. He took me down to like the right level. So, I was here, he was here. They were like um, the, the cutest high school couple. They never left each other at the end of the day. We became friends at 12, started dating 13, probably around 17. High school started going our separate ways. My sister had a baby, I went and visited. Then we kind of started re you know, rekindling things. And then um, that's when he told me he was going to be going into the Army. And he wanted to serve his country because he, he was all about the American flag. About He was all about us. He was all about the people. But he also, they help you out to go to school. They pay all your tuition. And his goal was to go to school as well. Reynoso served in the Army National Guard from 2004 to 2010, including a year as a gunner and driver in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. His squad cleared 150 improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, according to documents from Reynoso's psychiatrist his family shared with us. 
Reynoso told a psychiatrist at the Bedford VA Hospital in January of 2013 that five or six IEDs exploded as close as 20 yards from him. By July of 2012, he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and anxiety disorder. Hi, I'm Specialist Dennis Reynoso, stationed here in al Quds, Iraq. I want to give a shout out to all my friends and family back home in Lynn, Massachusetts, and a special shout out to my girl, Jessica. I'll see you soon. I was so happy when he came back. Um, he had bought me a ring. We were going to get married. Um, you know, when I found out I was having a baby with him, it was super exciting. He returned from his last tour in Iraq two months before Jessica gave birth to their son, Dennis Reynoso Jr. My first son is now with Dennis. That's when the couple years were not together, um, but he raised my son. Um, and then Dennis and I had our son in 2008. He stayed actually home with the baby while I went to work. And that's what happened that day too. 911, this line's recorded. We'll see, I just have your emergency. 115, O'Callaghan Way, with the management office. Um, there's a strange gentleman outside. He's outside swearing. He's got no shirt on. He's walking towards the management office. He's punching trees. Um, don't know what's going on exactly. He's talking to himself. Just getting a little scared. An employee of the apartment complex called 911 that Thursday morning when she and a coworker saw Dennis Reynoso wandering the ground shirtless, talking to himself and yelling. I saw him going like this, and then going like this. Witnesses recalled what they saw in state police interviews conducted hours after the shooting, which we obtained from both Reynoso's family and the Essex District Attorney's Office. So we locked the doors, and he was like talking to himself, or he was like irate, just weird gestures. And there was nobody else around him? Just the mailman was there. The mailman had worked the route that serves the complex since 2003. He told investigators he'd seen Reynoso before, but never acting like this. He was seeing right through me, and he was screaming how this was his hood. And he was just screaming at like a parked car or a car going by, telling him, get the F out of here. Whoever it was, he, he was seeing demons. Multiple witnesses later told police that Reynoso went back inside the apartment and closed the door. He just kind of turned and walked back to, towards his apartment at 46, and the last thing he said was, I love my country. 17, can you take a disturbance out front of 115 O'Callaghan Way? Three Lynn police officers responded to the 911 call. Officers John Bernard and Joshua Hilton, each on the force for seven years, and Officer Paul Scally, who is on his third week of training. You're about to hear from those officers in the tapes from police investigations conducted one day after the shooting. The employees who called 911 pointed the officers to the apartment where Reynoso had returned. One said she was worried about Reynoso's fiance in case she was inside and told the officers to be careful. I think she was scared. And that made me think that you know something scared her. Two officers went to the front door. One went to the back door. As we're going around, uh, a mailman uh, stated to me, hey, that guy that you guys are probably here for is a uh, Dennis Reynoso. He's a combat vet, and he, he might have post-traumatic stress. He's been out here all day yelling and screaming. The screaming had continued inside the apartment. Officers told investigators they heard it as they approached, and they weren't sure if Reynoso was talking to someone else or himself. You guys in the front? Roger, he's coming. At that time, I knock and announce, Lim police, Lim police. A male subject opened the door, swung the door open and started screaming, what do you want? What do you, what do, what do you guys want? You cops don't need to be here. At that point, he grabs the door, swings it out, and goes to rip it shut, and John kicks it as, it's, as he tries to shut it. In, it, in the door, just flies open, and he kind of steps back a couple feet. And at that point, um, John makes his way in. I'm standing, I'm standing right behind him. All right, we're inside. I was basically crossed that threshold to do a well-being check on anyone that was in that house because it is a family housing. Like I said, he was screaming at somebody in the house before we even got in. 
uh, before I even knocked it down. So I followed him in uh, to the house. So when he, even when I first went in there, I'm a cop that vet, and I tried to talk to him vet to vet, and it, he was not there. Officers Bernard and Scally said Reynoso sat on the couch and continued to scream at them. Scally started walking toward the back door to let in Officer Hilton, when they said Reynoso's behavior escalated. And I turned around and I saw him lunge off the couch and just and just charge him into, there was a big uh, flat screen TV there. He just ran right at him and kind of just bear hugged him and they were both wrapped up. At that point, I, uh, at that point I turned around and I just, I full sprinted towards him and um, right, right as I got to him, I, I heard John yell, gun, gun. The three officers gave investigators their account of how the struggle unfolded. And as he was jumped up at me, he goes, I'll show you what the f***s up, I'll show you what you're going to do. And just kind of attacked me, lunged at me at my waist. Um, and I immediately was now trying to defend myself. And then the next thing I knew, I had a gun touch at my head. As soon as I saw that, I yelled, gun! And I grabbed the gun of the barrel, and, and as I pushed it, he pulled the he pulled the trigger and the round went right over me. Came up, I put it up, now my two hands were on it. Their hands went both straight up like this. And um, it was both of the hands wrapped around on the firearm. So I go up and I I wrap both of my hands around the barrel. And um, that's when that's when we start struggling. Now all four of our hands were on it. Uh, five hands give us two. Also, Scott's both hands, my hands, and also um, the subject's hands were on it as well. I hear a shot go off. I kind of lost my hearing for a second. I, I, I was kind of dazed after that for a bit. It was, it went off probably right next to my ear, and it just everything went silent from there on out. And another round went off. Um, at that time, I, and then I tried to, uh, I started kind of punching him in the face, trying to. Not in his face, but the back of his head, trying to, you know, get him to stop while yelling, you know, let go of the guns, let go of the gun. And he's laughing at me as I'm hitting him to try to gain control of him. I, I feel like I, I thought I was, I I was going to die. The first gunshots didn't hurt anyone. Officer Bernard said he realized Reynoso had gotten hold of his own gun when he saw a flashlight attached to it as it fired. It happened so fast, I didn't... My gun was in my holster, locked in, and it still somehow got it out. Officer Scally said Reynoso bit him during the struggle. I see him start to kind of gain strength, and the, and the gun just starts to come down slowly towards me, me and him. And uh, that's, when, uh, that's when we kind of pushed his arm back. And at that point, uh, Josh came in. Immediately as I walked in, a, a shot, another shot went off. It was fired into the ceiling. So at this point, I drew out my weapon. And uh, the, the first thing I said to, to John was, I said, John, shoot him. It's just a reaction, and then that's when he said, it's my gun. And John said, shoot this mother shoot this mother And then I, and then Josh said, I'm going to shoot him. I'm going to shoot him. Hilton said he got close to Reynoso, pressed his gun against his ribs, and told him at least five times that he was going to shoot. I was trying to make sure that you know, John was okay with it, that he was going to be clear of the shot. Okay. And the reason you decided to shoot him was because of the struggle that it appeared to be not going there. He wasn't going to give up. He wasn't going to give up, and it, you know, it was only a matter of uh, a few inches or one of those bullets turns into shrapnel. All I could think of is that that first round that went into the ceiling when I turned the corner, if John had been directing it towards me, I'm like, you know, one of these is going to catch one of us. And uh, it was a, didn't look like it was a winning battle when I walked in, let's put it that way. Hilton fired once. Shot fired. It had taken less than one minute for the incident to escalate. The radio call of shots fired came in 48 seconds after the officers announced they were inside the apartment. Subject fell to the ground. Shortly after, you know, almost immediately, John was able to get control of his weapon. We rolled him onto his side and applied pressure as best we could. He continually struggled with us. It was almost impossible to give him first aid. He was hitting me. We have an ALS at 46, Newcastle. 
Shot fired. I couldn't even get really good pressure until uh, Sergeant Halsey showed up and was able to help hold down his arms so we could try to, you know, give the best first day we could, but, you know, he was at a bizarre strength. An ambulance arrived about five minutes after the shots fired radio call. The medics who treated Reynoso said he was still conscious, yelling, swearing, and trying to get up. And at one point when we were putting him on the board, I had to hold his hands while they um, strapped him to the board so that we could carry him. And uh, he still had a lot, a, lot of, a lot of strength. But the entire time, um, you know, everyone was trying to help him. And um, I did notice his face was looked a little gray um, because probably of the, the blood loss that he inside and outside. As Reynoso was taken to the hospital, officers Bernard and Scally swept the apartment to see if others were inside. They found Reynoso's five-year-old son in the room of the shooting. He was covered in blood. While we were in the corner fighting, I hear screaming and screaming as if a kid was screaming and yelling and crying and crying. And I thought it was my partner. There was a, a child on a couch to our left under a blanket. He was crying. I didn't know he was there at the time. I, I thought the crying was actually Officer Scally. According to officer affidavits, a detective saw that Dennis Jr. had blood stains on his hands, arms, and neck area and washed them off. Officers on scene brought the child to the management office to wait for his mother to pick him up. The management office employees gave him markers and some paper so he could draw. The detectives wrote that Dennis Jr. drew a photo of his house with his mother out front holding him and his brother standing close by. A little further away, the boy drew his father with a shield over his head to protect him. Police did not interview Dennis Reynoso Jr. as a witness for this case. Back on 11 to control. Control one. Can you throw in a Jessica Spinney with a two ends, EI, uh, EY, sorry. See if uh, she lives here at Fort Smith, Newcastle. Can you look in house, see if she's got a job, a phone number, anything like that, and get a hold of her, please? Jessica Spinney found out about her fiance shooting during a break at a management seminar for her job. And I turned the phone on. I had, his sister was calling, screaming. And I legit drove from Woburn to Lynn, probably going 100 miles an hour. I don't know how I didn't get stopped. I wanted to see, like, if this is real, I had to see. And when I pulled into the complex, I seen that there was yellow tape, ambulance, police, fire trucks, helicopters, and I just fell to the floor. I didn't even know that it was the police that shot him until until I got to the hospital. Spinney says she asked her son, Dennis Reynoso Jr., what he saw during the shooting. Dennis Jr., who is now 13 years old, did not want to be interviewed for this story. He said, Dad was yelling. Cops came in, he told them no. He still came in the door and put a flashlight to the back of his head and went boom, boom, and shot him. Reynoso was pronounced dead at 4.13 p.m. An autopsy found he died of a gunshot to the left flank and had blunt force injuries on his neck, thighs, upper right arm, and both hands. One month after the shooting, family members organized a rally to demand justice for Dennis Reynoso. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! And marched to the Lynn Police Department. There's a sergeant on duty that I can speak to. Hold on a minute. Thank you, sir. All right. You don't want to. Yes, I'm sorry. I don't have a house. The kids don't want to fuck. And you don't have a house. I need answers. The answers will come from the district attorney's office. First of all, I'm sorry for the loss. Okay. The answers will come from the district attorney's office. They are handling the investigation. So I told you that I'm, I don't have a husband anymore. I don't have a house. I don't have a father to my son anymore that they murdered him. Not a word. With nothing, that nobody's reached out to me. No indication of an actual investigation. Shame on you guys, really. The investigation will come from the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office could have an FE, too. Well, you're issuing the district attorney's office. It's not the police department. Well, look at this pocket. You're the ones that shot my husband in front of my five-year-old child. My husband was unarmed. 
I need an answer. My children need an answer. My five-year-old son has blood all over him. How if it was your son or your grandchild? Tell me how you would feel. Do you sleep at night? Because I haven't slept in 30 days. I haven't slept in 30 days. And I don't think I'll ever sleep again because of you guys. You're supposed to protect people. You don't take their life. They're just going to protect this fellow officer and go by his words. The Lynn Police Department, including the three officers involved in the shooting, declined to speak to us for this story. The year prior was the whole Trayvon Martin case that happened and it came down and then you had Jordan Davis and, and Dennis fell in that point in time where this was really moving into the forefront of everyone's minds. Peter Alvarez, who is married to Dennis Reynoso's cousin and is now a corporate lawyer, spoke to the crowd during the 2013 rally. There were three armed police officers going to investigate a disturbing the peace call. How that turns into someone murdered within their home by police officers without a warrant in front of their son is a question that none of us can answer right now. And whatever details are released from the DA's investigation isn't going to answer that either. I was in law school when he was killed by the police inside his home and in the midst of kind of everything going on at the time um, when it came to police brutality, taking the courses I was taking on, you know, due process and Fourth Amendment rights, it just really struck me at that time how wrong it all was. There's little evidence of what happened inside the apartment other than what police officers told investigators. Officers weren't wearing body cameras. The Lynn Police Department didn't require them until April of 2021. The only other people inside were Reynoso and his then five-year-old son, who was not interviewed. Seeing a district attorney's report that doesn't necessarily it doesn't give any answers. It doesn't give answers on any of the inconsistencies. Like one, how they actually cross the threshold and enter his home, were they invited in by him? All indications show that he kept saying, I don't need help, I don't need you here. And then reading like the DEA report and stuff of things that, that say that he never had any gun residue on his hands. Um, there was no DNA evidence of him having a gun in his hands. The next piece was, you know, how did the gun, how did he get the gun? Yeah, they said that he took it from the holster, it was worn, but should the officers have left their, you know, place of work when, when, when they're going on patrol, when they're going to go see someone that they are, have already been told was in distress with a broken holster? Reynoso's hands didn't have any gun residue, according to the report. Prosecutors said it's possible his hands were washed during surgery, and forensic experts told us that testing is unreliable after four hours. The report emphasized that Bernard's holster, where the gun was pulled from, was worn out and had a missing screw. On whether police officers need search warrants to enter a house, they usually do, but the law does allow them some leeway for emergencies. Jack McDevitt is the director of the Institute on Race and Justice at Northeastern University. He is addressing general police protocol here and is not speaking specifically to the Reynoso case. If they're asked to check on, on a person on a wellness check or a disturb, disturbance, then they are allowed to continue their investigation till they determine that that's no longer a part of it. For some experts, the DA's report created more questions than it answered. Forensic evidence from the scene wasn't conclusive that Reynoso fired a shot. Still, forensic experts from the University of Hartford told us it is possible, based on information in the report. Ultimately, Essex District Attorney Jonathan Blodgett deemed the shooting justified and closed the case almost five months after the shooting. His office repeatedly declined to speak to us for the story, but he determined at the time that the officers were in imminent danger of being shot and that Reynoso posed a threat to others. In order for the shooting to be proven lawful, he said the officer's actions must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer at the scene and in that moment in time, and not through the perspective of hindsight. A veteran ends up killed inside of his home in front of his child. 
that's a tragedy that happens. Um, I think we owe it to Dennis, to his family, to the people of Lynn and the people in Massachusetts to find out what happened in there. In fact, the Reynoso family pursued legal action, but their cases were dismissed and they had a falling out with one of the attorneys, who has since been disbarred for a separate case he worked on. To be honest with you, if I had a lot of money and millions, I could have got the greatest lawyer and there would have been justice for my brother right now. But I'm a middle class person, I don't have that type of money. And the cops, as I say, Lynn police have more power than I do. One year after the shooting, Governor Deval Patrick gave officers John Bernard, Joshua Hilton, and Paul Scally the George L. Hanna Award for Bravery. For the family, that's among the most galling parts of what happened. You don't award somebody for killing. Like, who, the, who does that? I think that was disgusting, and I have no words for that, to be honest with you. To me, that was a slap in the face. Now, when Dennis's son or any member of his family, his nephews, nieces, go and look him up, you're forever going to see that the officers that killed him in this tragic situation were called heroes for it and pinned by a governor for killing him. It wasn't for something else. It was for killing him and traumatizing a child forever. And I, I don't know how we, as people from Massachusetts and, 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 and the citizens of Massachusetts can be okay with that. Patrick's office acknowledged our request for comment but didn't make the former governor available for an interview or provide a statement. A representative noted that recipients of the award are selected by a committee. In an attempt to reach out to committee members, we were unable to receive comment on why they selected the officers. The incident that led to Reynoso's death, like many others, involves mental health. Nearly half of the 65 people killed by Massachusetts State Police from 2005 to 2015 were suicidal or showing clear signs of mental illness. That's according to a Boston Globe investigation from 2016. And a report from the Treatment Advocacy Center a year earlier showed individuals with untreated mental illness are 16 times more likely to be killed during altercations with the police. So I definitely think Dennis should, should have been taken out of the home and, and spoken to outside of the home um, instead of going inside where he probably felt attacked. So there's definitely got to be other ways to handle these situations. Another prominent police shooting victim whose name is often brought up by police reform activists in Massachusetts is Terrence Coleman a schizophrenic man killed in 2016 after his mother called 911 so he could be taken to a hospital for help. Authorities say Coleman attacked Boston emergency medical technicians with a knife. The Suffolk County District Attorney ruled the shooting was justified, but his mother maintains her son didn't pose any threat and is suing the city. At this October 2020 rally, Hope Coleman told her son's story and demanded justice. My son didn't shot when I called for help. And the system needs to know how to send out people to take care of mental health. The challenge is in those moments when the adrenaline's flowing and everything's there, can you get police officers to take a step back and say, is there any rush to do this? Professor McDevitt said police protocols often try to prioritize officer safety at the scene of ongoing crimes, in fear of a worst case scenario that often doesn't happen. Every time somebody loses their life at the hands of a police officer, we should take that as an opportunity to think about how we change policing. We should be really asking ourselves, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? He pointed to the Cambridge Police Department, which he says could serve as a model for other departments responding to mental health calls. Cambridge Police Officer Cameron Dean leads training courses in ICAT, a de-escalation training program for officers. It stands for Integrating Communications, Assessment, and Tactics. The program is designed for situations involving unarmed people or people with weapons other than firearms. I think the training, what it's done is it's made the officers 
a lot more aware that we have options available to us and that just because a person is a threat doesn't make them immediately threatening. An officer trained in ICAT goes through decision-making models, safety tactics, crisis recognition, and response training, including mental and situational crisis scenarios where the officers learn best communication skills in order to talk people down to reduce the chance of an altercation becoming deadly. When I went through the training, you think you're gonna do these things because that's what you're seeing in your head. And then when you're actually in the scenario, you realize like, I am saying the same thing over and over again. I am saying, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. I'm not saying, hey, what's going on? What's your plan with that knife? I'm not using good communication skills because my brain is saying, knife, I'm afraid. And I start going into this, this self-preservation mechanism. And it's not that we can eliminate that, but maybe what we can do is teach officers to recognize through training, I'm saying the same thing over and over again and nothing's changing. We can't change what the other person does, but we might be able to change what we do. I think that's the focus of the training. While Cambridge has not released any numbers showing ICAT's impact, a University of Cincinnati study of ICAT in the Louisville, Kentucky Police Department found that use of force incidents dropped by 28%, citizen injuries fell 26%, and officer injuries dropped by 36% from the year before ICAT was introduced to the year after. It would be impossible, I think, to say that ICAT prevents these situations from happening. I, I don't think you can prevent it. I do think you can make officers more conscious about what they're about to step into and at least try and take steps to mitigate that from happening. Since Reynoso's shooting, policing in the city of Lynn has changed. In October of 2020, residents called for police reform at a public hearing on responding to mental health crises. They used Reynoso's case as the prime example. Matthew Griffin is a diversity ambassador and civil rights committee member for a local union. He is also a lifetime Lynn resident and the brother of Reynoso's best friend. Griffin cited Reynoso's story in arguing for body cameras and an unarmed crisis response team. The police were called to Dennis's house for a man that was possibly suffering from a PTSD incident in Kings Lynn. At the end of the day, Mr. Reynoso lost his life to the hands of the Lynn police. I asked this question. If there was an unarmed response team that had approached Mr. Reynoso in this situation, a man that had seen the horrors of war in Iraq and what weapons can do and, and, and what it's like to be on the other side of a violent attack, could an unarmed response team have de-escalated that situation? I believe uniformed men with guns showing up and, and, and it heightened his PTSD that he was possibly going through. I also believe that had it gotten to a point where police presence was needed in this situation, that body cameras would tell us the story that Mr. Reynoso cannot tell us today. In April of 2021, Lynn police officers began wearing body cameras. The department's policy notes they are effective law enforcement tools that reinforce the public's perception of police professionalism and preserve factual representations of officer-civilian interactions. And in July of 2021, Lynn City officials approved half a million dollars for an unarmed crisis response team for mental health emergency calls. A pilot program is expected to begin at the start of 2022. Other places in Massachusetts are announcing changes too. In April of 2021, Boston Mayor Kim Janey said the city was working on a pilot program to reduce police involvement in mental health crises and get mental health experts more involved. We must reimagine how we respond to crisis in our city. Parts of that includes a planning process for how we respond to mental health crises. Reynoso's family has pushed for justice for the last eight years, making little progress. They felt defeated after the shooting was deemed justified. The officers were awarded for their actions, and the family's lawsuit fell through. We want justice! We want justice! We want justice! You feel like it's a never-ending battle when you're up against the police. It's happening more and more, and every time I see something on, on TV or I see something on the, on the media, like it affects me. I feel like I'm seeing it all over again. 
People don't understand that when you lose a loved one like that, it doesn't just go away. It's something that stays with you forever. Brock Satter is one of the organizers for Mass Action Against Police Brutality, a seven-year-old grassroots activist organization that holds rallies to demand justice for families. What happened with the Dennis Reynoso fight is kind of what was happening for decades. You know, people would protest around a case up until the DA said they weren't going to indict, and then it kind of just died down and you didn't hear about it. But the beautiful thing is with this movement, and I think with the demand to reopen the case too, it's helped people understand, no, this, this fight's not over. We'll decide when it's over. Like a lot of families, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle. It's a, it can be overwhelming. And you know, some families have, yeah, completely been broken and demoralized. And that's why, you know, we've, we've, we've been demanding the, to reopen the cases. Every fall, Reynoso's family members gather together on either Dennis Reynoso's birthday or the anniversary of his death. In this October 2020 footage, the family met at the cemetery to pray and to pay their respects. Reynoso's family visited his grave again this year to remember his life. What's up, Chris? What's up? How's everything? How you doing? ¿Cómo está? Bien, ¿y tú? Tranqui. <laughs> Hola. Bien, ¿y tú? What's going on, sister? We actually buried Dennis the day that him and I were supposed to get married. So, September 11th was supposed to be the day that we were supposed to go, and that was actually the day that I, I buried him. Este Padre Nuestro y Ave María que tengo rezada es por el alma de Denis Reynoso para que el Señor lo tenga en su santo reino y que brille para él la luz externa. Si no se lo ha sabido rezar ni tampoco ofrecérselo, perdona la falta que ha habido en ella. En el nombre del Padre, del Hijo, del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Amén. Thank you. Talk, tell him how the kids are doing, even though I know he sees every day how they're doing. I still like to tell him all the updates. Dennis doing good in school, or doing working, or all that good stuff. A family's still hurting, and we're gonna still be hurting all the rest of our lives because we don't have him near us. They'll never feel the heart, heartbreak that I felt. 